Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so welcome for the uh, symposium uh, 2022. And we are in the session two about marine research and society this morning with the distance we'll have Ocean, Florence, and Fernando. Ocean, we talk about the Mediterranean teleostectoparasite and their associated microbiome. Florence, about the impact of the blue carbon potentials of microalgae, and Fernando Ruiz Iglesias on the carbon stores and the carbon loss with um, sea grass. So, um, first, before we start, I would like to uh, officially thank the different reviewers who have uh, reviewed the different uh, master's thesis of this session. So, thank you to Elena Bovio, Virginia Weiss, Guillaume Chandelier, Laetitia Zulo, Hubert Bonfon, uh, and uh, Lionel Pouchet, and Adine Amdel. And today, uh, with us, we have um, uh, the jury, uh, which is here, so Elena Bovio from Université de Azur, INRA, uh, Hubert Bonfond from Université de Azur, INRIA, and Alina Biel from Université de Côte d'Azur, IRCAM, together with Jean Vasson, Vyotin Rassa, who is uh, coming with a different point of view, the one from high school teacher in biology, and also active member of the NGO Natural Life. Uh, so it's time, I guess, to welcome uh, Océane on the show. Mm -hmm. Hello, Océane. Océane, uh, you know that you're going to have 15 minutes to, to present. Yes. Uh, can you uh, remind us where you are currently? So currently, I'm in Bagnol sur Mer at the CNRS. Okay. And uh, so after the 15 minutes, we will have uh, something like 20 minutes of questions from the tree. Mm -hmm. I can propose you to uh, start sharing your screen. Yes. Okay. You can make a go full screen for the week. Okay, we can see the screen and we can see you uh, at the same time. Okay, perfect. Do you have um, a 15 minute uh, countdown in front of you? Yes, I do have it. You're all set up, so. Good. <laughs> you can start. Okay, perfect. Sorry. So, hello, my name is Océane Renato. I'm a second year student of the Marais program, and I did my internship at the CNRS at Bagnol sur Mer. I was supervised by Sophie Sanchez and Judith Rivo, and the topic of my internship was Mediterranean teleost exoparasite and their associated microbiome. So, first, this internship focused on a host. So, it's a Mediterranean spiridae, so it's Pagellus erythrinus but also its parasites from the lamellodiscus genus. It's a monogen ectoparasite that you can see on the picture here. So we choose this association because it's a very important association between the Mediterranean spiridae and the lamellodiscus. And now it's important to introduce you to the life cycle of the lamellodiscus. So first you have the monogen eggs in the environment and then the eggs will hatch and become a ciliated larvae. The ciliated larvae will find a fish and will attach on a skin. At this moment, the larvae will lose the ciliature and it will migrate to the host gills. And in the gills, this larvae will become an adult parasite and this adult parasite will lay an egg in the marine environment. So we decided to use this study model because of this table. So in this table, you have the distribution of the specific richness between the parasite genus from the lamellodiscus species and the host, so the Mediterranean sparidae that we can find in the Gulf of Lyon. So here on this table, you have all the sparidae species in the Gulf of Lyon, and here you have the lamellodiscus species. So for example, if we look at the fish that I'm interested on, so Pagellus erythrinus, if I look on this column, there is only one black area here, and it's with Lamellodiscus erythrinae. And looking at the last column of this table, you have the parasitic specificity, and here it's equal to one, so it means that they are specialists. So if you look at Pagellus erythrinus, you will find Lamellodiscus erythrinae only for the Lamellodiscus genus. So if you look at other species here, for example, the parasitic specificity is equal to six, four, or 
two or more, it means that they are generalists. So you find many species of lamellodiscus on different Speridae species. So the association between the parasite and the host, the fish, is very well studied. But now, thanks to a new concept called the tripartite association, we can focus on the parasite, the host, but also the microbiome. And this remains not well studied. So the microbiome here, it's a microorganism in an environment and the genetic material. So more globally, the microbiome can modulate various physiological activities in the host. And I focus on this internship on the skin and the gills mucus because it's the major area of exchange between the host and the environment. And also the mucus acts as a physical barrier against the potential infection that the fish can face. The monogen are a class of flatworms that we can find on the skin and the gills. So they are defined by the position, also the life cycle that I showed you just before, and the specificity here, the specific relationship. And the monogen will feed on fish gill epithelium. So the fish that I study on is Pagellus erythrinus. It's a fish that we can find in the Mediterranean Sea, in the Black Sea, and also in the Northeast Atlantic. The common size is 15 centimeters to 30 centimeters. You can find it in the sand, the mud, the gravel, and even in the rocks in the coastal waters from 20 to 100 meters deep. And this fish is omnivorous. So the problematic of my internship was to know if there was a correlation between the lamellodiscus erythrinic parasite occurrence in the common pendra and the presence of a specific bacterial communities in the fish mucus. The hypothesis here, according to the literature, is that there might be a correlation between all the three members of this tripartite association. So I divided the work in two approaches. Here you have the first approach, where the goal was to know if it was possible to keep wild common pendra in captivity and to manipulate the parasitic load. So the hypothesis here, according to a work made by a private student in a team is that it's possible it might be possible to keep white common pendra in captivity and manipulate the parasitic load and the objective on this approach were to do aquariology larvae parasite eggs monitoring larvae survival and deparasitizing protocol the second approach was to know if the bacterial communities described in pagellus erythrinus are similar to those observed in other host species with the same ecological threat. And here the hypothesis was that the bacterial communities might be different according to the fish species. And the objective were to do fishing, dissection, DNA extraction, PCR of the V3V4 region of the 16S, shell electrophoresis, cleaning, normalization, concentration, and after to send all the samples to an Illumina MySec sequencing lab. So for the first approach, the monitoring of the lamellodiscus erythrini, so the parasites. So fish were fished in early December in a bay of banyan sur in the Gulf of Lyon. And because they are white fish, we faced a constraint of availability of the fish. Also for the aquariology, I changed the water each week. Also, I cleaned the mass of filtration each week and I fed the fish daily with a muscle mixture. And so assess the eggs monitoring to assess the quantity of eggs, I've been able to use eggs collector. So it's kneeling thread with a lead ball at the end. And it's a non-invasive technique. So you can see the presence of eggs on the eggs collector or not. But just attention, if we don't have if we don't have any eggs on the eggs collector, it doesn't mean that there is no eggs in the aquarium because the, the eggs can swim in the water column. And I observed the X collector three times a week with a binocular microscope. So here is the deparasitizing protocol. So it's a theoretical protocol. First, you have the biological material that is available. And after you have the deparasiting protocol. So the deparasiting treatment with 40 liters of seawater and 250 milliliters of hydrogen peroxide. And the fish were put in this condition for two hours and after an artificial parasitizing step. 
but that was not the goal of my internship. For uh, the second approach, there is the preparation of the meta barcoding library. So from June 2021 to March 2022, fish were fished in the Gulf of Lyon, and I've been able to do the DNA extraction with a kit from Zemo Research, the Quick Gen Africa Soil Micro Mini Prep Kit. So the goal of this kit was to do a bacterial wall disease using that tube and a fast prep. So, so the, um, the bacteria were broken and I had the access to the DNA of the bacteria that was present in the mucus of the fish. And thanks to this, I've been able to send two, 205 sample, so six seawater sample, 199 fish sample, 100 kills, and 99 skin mucus. So for the PCR, I use the primer of the V3V4 region of the 16S. So the 16S is the gene used to identify and classify the bacteria. And I did the first PCR to increase the DNA quality of the region of interest. I did it in triple case, but because at the end I didn't have enough DNA quantity to send it to a second signal, I did a second PCR where I add two unique barcodes to each sample following the Illumina MySec protocol. And thanks to this, I've been able to send only a pool of all the samples to the second sync lab. And after I send it to the second sync lab where they did the Illumina MySec sequencing. And for the normalization, I use the, the kit from Thermo Fisher. And for the concentration, I use the kit from Comega, following the manufacturer's instruction. And for the result, here you have the first approach where the goal was to know if it was possible to keep white common pendra in captivity and manipulate the parasitic load. So here you have a picture of the eggs. So the eggs have a triangular shape here. And when you look at the eggs parasite monitoring, in January and in February, we didn't have enough eggs to start the experiment. And in March, it started to increase. And really at the end of March, we could start the experiment because we had enough eggs to start it. So it was necessary to wait until March to start the experiment. Here, as a reminder, I added the protocol of the deparasiting experiment. And on this graph, you can see that I applied the first treatment. And after it, I still had eggs. So I took the decision to do a second treatment one week after. And I had one egg here. So I took it off. And maybe it was an erratic egg because after following the other weeks, I didn't find any more eggs. So now the team has a reliable protocol and also the fish seem to support both treatments. So for the second approach, the goal was to know if the bacterial communities described in Pachelis are similar to other host species with the same ecological threat. So here for the PCR for the meta barcoding, I've been able to optimize the sample. So when you look here for the PCR2 with one microliter of PCR1 project that was made with one microliter of extracted DNA, I was supposed to have a signals here with a large black line and I do not have it. So I increased here the quantity of the PCR1 project. I got two microliter. It's a bit better, but it's not optimal. And after I increased also the DNA put in the first PCR, so two microliter of extracted DNA and two microliter of PCR1 project. And I have the signal that I was expecting here, this large black band here. And so the sample were sent to a sequencing lab. They just arrived, so they are not analyzed yet, unfortunately. And for the discussion of the deparasitizing of white fish, I faced a lack of parasite eggs. So that's why the experiment was postponed until the end of March. And maybe it could be explained by a seasonality effect, because all the aquariums still had the same condition from January and March. And it was different, it just increased in March. So maybe they have something in their physiology that could alter this. And um, for the behavior of the wild fish, they were extremely stressed in the aquarium. And it could be explained by the fact that they do not come from aquaculture. And the only fish that I lose during the experiment were the biggest fish. So maybe the smallest fish are more adapted to be in the aquarium. And for uh, the deparasitizing protocol, so to our knowledge, it's the first time that it was made on Pachelisei Phoenix. And to be sure that we can manipulate the parasite load, it's important to do the deparasitizing treatment two times. And later, it will be useful for the team to assess the effect of parasite load on the fish physiology by comparing 
artificially parasitic fish with not parasitic fish. So here the hypothesis is confirmed. We can keep away common pendra in captivity and manipulate the parasitic load. And for the structure of the microbial communities in the fish mucus, so because we haven't been able to analyze the sequence yet, I found an article that, that look at the microbial communities of Pagellus eutinus. So they found mostly proteobacteria, fusobacteria, and fusionicus. And for the gills, they found fusobacteria and proteobacteria. So we can see that even if it's the same species, they do not have the same microbial communities. Maybe it could be explained by the more backward position of the gills. Also, the diet could alter the microbial structure because maybe there is an indirect transfer of bacteria from the gut to the skin through the feces. And also they compare with other Mediterranean sporidae and the structure of microbial communities are not the same between the different species. And here I focus more about the microbial communities, but there is something also with the larvae because on an article they found specific larvae in other host species on the skin and it disappeared in the gills. So maybe it means that there is a filter of specificity in the host that can happen between the skin and the gills. So here it's not possible to confirm or deny the hypothesis yet. And thanks to my internship, I've been able to improve the deparasitizing protocol. I've been also able to improve the PCR protocol. And thanks to this, the team will be able to do some attractivity tests, artificial infestation, metabolomic analysis, for example. And when the sequence will be analyzed, maybe we'll find something that will go with what I found on the literature. For example, for the bacterial structure that is close for seawater and skin mucus, but different with the gill mucus. Maybe they will find something with a specificity so maybe that the monogen larvae can parasite other fish species temporarily. And also some, something that could have an impact on the bacterial structure could be the fish host species, the tissue analyzed, but also the diet of the fish. So thank you a lot for listening. Thank you for the jury here. Thank you for the nice academic team. Thank you also for my supervisor. And it was a real pleasure to do this internship. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for staying on time and to finish on this little fish. Um, so here is the floor for the jury. Who would like to start? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Suzanne. Hi. Thanks for this nice talk. So um, my, my question is, OK, in a more general context, so why did you perform such study? Um, because it could be interesting to compare. So for example, you have the fish, in more general way with the, all the fish. It could be interesting to know if the parasites, so the ectoparasites, have an impact on the, the health, the physiology of the fish. So it could be interesting to compare a fish artificially parasitic with a non-artificially parasitic. So when we start the experiment, we know that they come from the same, the same parasitic load. So it could be more important to compare it together. So it will be able to do some metabolomic analysis, transcriptomic analysis, and metabarcoding analysis to really know the impact of the parasite on the fish. Okay, thanks. Um, so you mentioned that after the two treatment, your fish is going well. So what are you what are you read out to say that so what are you looking on the fish to mention that so to say that it's uh, the fish is going well uh, so i look at the behavior of the fish i look also if they still had the same behavior than before and i also talk with the aquology team to have their their what they think about the health of the fish what and they sent uh, so the really how they swim, the behavior in the water column, if they're just down or if they still move uh, in all the aquarium and if they feed on the, the same quantity as before. But it's just an outside view of the fish, it's not inside of the, the body of the fish. Thank you.
that's uh, that's lead to uh, another question about the behavior uh, how you can know that it is not the, the condition of aquarium that leads to the to this behavior in particular um so they were in different aquariums so first they were in quarantine in a big aquarium so it was only the aquarius that took care of them it was during the month of december and early january and after we transferred them to a bigger aquarium where they were all together and after we changed them in smaller aquarium where it was a bit different so just to know the behavior i really asked a lot about the with the aquarology team to have their their knowledge okay and uh, just for conf uh, confirmation uh, can you define the ecological traits and uh, give me uh, some example of uh, of them Okay, so for me, the ecological threat is, for example, the environment, the type of food that they will use, if they're omnivorous, carnivorous, or herbivorous, and also the area where they live, so really their environment, if they live in a, a sandy bottom, in a rocky bottom. So that was the, the ecological threat that I look when uh, I try to compare La Melodiscus, the Pagelus Eitrinus, and other fish species. Okay. Okay. Uh, so thanks for the presentation. I have a first question just to better understand. You want to compare the bacteria community with the uh, um, fishes that were without uh, pathogens and the fish with pathogen stars? So it was with the parasites. Yes, we want to compare the, no problem, the bacteria communities and the parasites and the endomicus of the fish. So you use hydrogen peroxide. So my question is, are you sure that this will not affect the bacterial community? So this, uh, so I'm not sure that it will not affect the bacterial communities. And I use the hydrogen peroxide because a previous student in the team compare three different protocols to depositize the fish. And uh, a team from Perpignan did this with hydrogen peroxide. So yes, they use this on the fish. That's why we use this one, but I'm not sure if it to not alter the microbial communities. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's quite an issue because when you will get back the results and if you will see a difference in the bacterial community, you will not know, uh, yeah. Is this due to the treatment or uh, to the pathogens? Uh, mm -hmm. The parasites, sorry. And the other question is about why you look for a bacteria and not uh, for other uh, microorganisms? Um, we look at the bacteria because the goal here was to know if we need to compare the, the bacterial structure. So that's why we choose the 16S. Okay. Gen you think that, I don't know, fungi could not be interesting? In, uh, this kind of study? Mm, I think it could be interesting to analyze the fungi also. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, if I understood well, for in your second part of your, of your work, you, you go in the sea, you catch uh, fishes at different time in the year. Uh, fishes are exotherm uh, animals, so there are, there are is, is, their body at, at the temperature of the of, of the outside, uh, and the bacteria development is strongly related to, to temperature. So, are you not uh, afraid that uh, you the difference that you will observe uh, between your fishes are due to the season and not uh, due to different treatments that you will apply in your in your experiments? That's exactly the uh, a problem that we're facing now. Because when the seconds arise, the PhD student with who I'm working with, so she did Revo, tried to, to look at the, the sequence and she did a meeting with a, someone very good in bioinformatics. And that's the question that they had because they, they saw that there is something with the season. And that was a, a really, really good question that we faced. So yes, we're a bit scared of this. And a, a second question, uh, still concerning the temperature. It was not uh, possible to forecast that you will not find eggs uh, in winter. 
because of the temperature, because it's not really a, a time for animals to reproduce uh, themselves. So uh, at the beginning of the internship, so in January, it was really an um, exploratory experiment to look okay. if we had eggs or not. So that's when we saw that we didn't have eggs, that we started to, to change something in the aquarology condition. We changed the light, we changed everything that we could. And yes, we faced this issue. So thanks to this experiment, now we know that there is a lack of parasite, but it's true that it's not surprising. Thank you. Sorry. I'd like to ask uh, another question. Uh, and that, that uh, remark on the bacteria composition and the effect of uh, the seasons is linked to the ecological trends. And that the, the ecological traits are not just the food and the environment, but also the seasonality of the population, the, the size, the mobility of the species, etc. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's very important to take into account all these ecological traits when you compare results, when you doing the interpretation, etc. Okay. But I have an, another, uh, just um, a question about if it, uh, are there other examples of a, uh, teleo species that are the subject of the same studies with uh, the tripartite association or uh, on the tripartite association yes i when i look at the um, at the literature i found other species that were also analyzed with um, the fish the parasite and the microbial communities it's a very new concept but it, you can find some article about it and uh, what, what kind of uh, species uh, it was also uh, the Mediterranean Spirit Day because the, the PhD student of this team start to work on it. So it's uh, now so now my project was on a PhD project. And before her, there was another person so called Mathilde Schechler. And she published some article about this and she had the same issue with the Chipotle Association. So it's also the Mediterranean Teleos. Okay. Mm. Thank you. So if you have now to uh, to restart this project, so what you will change to improve it? Mm, if I had to, so first I will start with the, the meta barcoding analysis because at the beginning in January, I was really focused on the X monitoring because I really came for this. And after in March, end of mid-February, we start the meta barcoding analysis. So if I had to start the project again, I will start really in March, in the January, sorry, with the meta barcoding analysis. So I could have the, the sequence now, I could have analyzed them now. So I would have the, the answer of my question now. <laughs> and after I will, for the deparasitizing experiment, so I will do two treatments really at the start, at the beginning. Even if I understand that what you have done is far from the application, uh, do you imagine that uh, your results uh, could be in some way, I don't know, the, uh, what you will obtain will be in some way useful uh, for uh, some kind of application uh, in the future? Do you match that or not? Mm, I think that this was useful for the team because now they have a a reliable protocol for the deforestation, the deforestation. And also now if they had to start it again and do some other meta barcoding uh, sampling, they could just follow the protocol. Now we have the, the information of what we should do, what we should do. So I think that it can be useful for this team. Okay, but uh, I mean, uh, like in aquaculture or so on, uh, do you see some advantages of uh, knowing this for uh, uh, edible fishes. Uh, uh, for the fish, yeah. So now I will know that I will. I know which condition I will apply on the fish. I know that I will put them in a big aquarium. I know that as I can. I know that I will try to have only the smallest bacillaceae because the biggest have some more difficulties to to stay in the aquariums. And I will put them in a in a in an area where there is not a lot of person coming inside of the, the place. 
So I will have some improvement for uh, the condition of the fish. Thank you. Okay, it's the opportunity for the very last question. That's good. That's good? Good, yeah. Thank you, Sam. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Anna. It's the end of your, of your masterpiece uh, here at least. So, um, good luck for, for the following and so see you soon. Yes, thank you a lot. For, for everyone also following, uh, so now it's time for a break, some water and the things for the jury if you want. And we will be back on live at 11 with uh, Florence and then with uh, Fernando. See you soon, just after the break. Hello everyone and welcome back for uh, the second part of the session two on my research and society. Um, this uh, second part will uh, have uh, the pleasure to listen to Florence Lacrosse on the impact of the blue carbon, the control of microalgae, and Fernando with Ecclesias uh, on carbon spoil and carbon loss on uh, seagrass. It's time to welcome Florence. Hello. Hello. Sound is good, uh, good for you? You hear us well? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, it's all Perfect. good. Um, so, Florence, I can propose you to share your screen already. Yeah. And at the same time, I will remind you that you're going to have 15 minutes uh, to present. So, just to make sure that you have a, a 15 minute countdown, maybe, in front of you. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so, I can also uh, remind you the jury in front of you. We've got uh, here Elena Bovio, Université de Côte d'Azur, INRA, Hubert Bonfond, Université de Côte d'Azur, INRIA, Algin Daniel, uh, Université de Côte d'Azur, IRCAN, and uh, Jean-Vincent de Nigrassa, who is a high school teacher in, um, in biology, and also an active member of Nature Day. Great. So I can see your screen uh, on our side, it's all good. Good for you too? Perfect. Can I start? Yes, you get to start, so let's enjoy. Thank you. Well, good morning. My name is Florence Lacrosse, and I'll be presenting my master thesis studying impacts on the blue carbon potential of macroalgae. Did you know that in some ways, macroalgae are similar to the Amazon rainforest? Not only do they cover the exact same area, they're also similar when it comes to primary productivity. This high productivity means that macroalgae have a lot of potential to store carbon over a long term, what we refer to as blue carbon. And this is very important for climate change mitigation. So why focus on macroalgae? Well, despite being the dominant primary producers in coastal areas, Macroalgae are often understudied and sometimes forgotten when it comes to blue carbon. This is because of their role as carbon donors. Unlike other complex, um, other, unlike other blue carbon habitats, they lack complex root systems to store carbon in their sediments. Instead, macroalgae export carbon to other sink habitats where it is stored for a long term. This storage accounts for 2.68 teragrams of carbon per year. Well, what does this value mean? 
that is more than the carbon sequestered by all other blue carbon habitats combined. I'm talking about seagrasses, tidal marshes, and also mangroves. As you can imagine, blue carbon in macroalgae is gaining a lot of recognition. And for it to be in, for macroalgae to be included in blue carbon strategies, we need to um, take further research on this subject to understand what impacts them as well and their blue carbon. That is why this study aimed to study the changes in blue carbon potential of macroalgae along a human impact gradient in the Eastern Mediterranean. In this study, I define blue carbon potential and measure it as the organic carbon content, as well as the overall macroalgal coverage. Studies have already looked into the human impacts on the blue carbon and macroalgae. Well, not so much the blue carbon, but in their communities and their assemblages. Um, they've focused on the impacts of sedimentation and turbidity from rivers mostly. And they've found that with increasing sedimentation and turbidity, there's up to 95% reduction in primary productivity, as well as a shift in species. We're talking about a shift from long-lived late successional species to fast-growing opportunistic species. Based on these findings, I've hypothesized that the blue carbon potential will decrease with increasing human impact. This is subdivided into three hypotheses. One, that with increasing human impact, we see a reduction in the, blue, the carbon content of some species and an increase for others. Two, with increasing human impact and specifically sedimentation and turbidity, we have a reduction in overall macroalgal coverage and a shift in species towards opportunistic species. The third hypothesis is that the three Cs are correlated. That's carbon content, coverage, and composition. So let's look at our study area in Limassol, Cyprus. We can see that the city center is quite urbanized. We've also got a marina here and several rivers contributing to human impact along the coast. Along the coast, we also see a series of breakwaters um, with macroalgal habitats growing on them. These breakwaters have been subdivided into three stations of varying human impact. I measured human impact using the Malusi index, which looks at accumulation of different anthropogenic stresses within a three kilometer radius of macroalgal communities. At each of my breakwaters, I sampled three points, um, and sorry, six points, two times three points. And at these six points, we're measuring um, macroalgal community metrics, as well as taking samples of five species of algae. These are the five species that were present across all the breakwaters. At each point, um, I placed a quadrat on the breakwater and photographed it to extract the coverage and composition of the species. By composition, I'm referring specifically to the proportion of late successional species and opportunistic species, according to Orfanidis et al.'s 2011 Ecological Evaluation Index. At each of the quadrats, I also took several samples of macroalgae from the five species, and I brought these back to the lab to be combusted at 550 degrees to extract their organic carbon content. So let's have a look at what we found. Here on the horizontal axis, we see the Malusi anthropogenic stress index. So higher values mean more human impact. On the vertical axis, we've got the organic carbon content. And for all five species, we see a reduction in this OCC. Um, the reduction is greatest for Dictyota dichotoma at 6.1%. Looking at the two species here on the top, these are the calcifying species, and they had a much lower reduction than the other species. Uh, we can also see that their scale is a lot smaller, so they've got less total organic carbon content. 
Another interesting observation is that the relationships are significantly quadratic. So that means that the intermediate impact station for the red algae here on the left is highest at a maximum, and the intermediate impact station for the brown algae are at the minimum for these three. Moving on to the hypothesis now, I think we can um, safely say that we've rejected the hypothesis because we've seen a reduction in carbon content for all types of species. So I'm going to change that. And we also now looking back at the literature found that, well, we're actually a bit limited in our comparisons to the literature because no other studies have looked at organic carbon content and human impact. But if we're comparing rather to a variation in organic com carbon content and more to the set values, then the values in the literature match up quite well with those of this study. Um, the literature also reports lower organic carbon content for the two calcifying species um, and for calcifying species in general. And this is because most of their carbon is in the form of inorganic carbon, so calcium carbonate for the calcifying species. Moving on to coverage and composition. Here on the horizontal axis, we have again the anthropogenic stress index. And on the vertical axis, we've got the EEIC, which is color coded according to different ecological status classes. The higher values or the good status classes represent more late successional species. The size of the different bubbles also show us how much macroalgal coverage we have. So for both variables, we see a reduction with increasing human impact. Um, if we look at the least impacted station here, we see a good ecological status class in green. And for the more impacted stations, a moderate ecological status class in yellow. And we see a reduction in the bubble sizes, but we'll see that more clearly with these pie charts here. So here we've got in orange, the opportunistic species and in blue, the late successional species. The white area is where we've got no living macroalgae. From a first look, we can see that the most and intermediate impact stations are very similar. They both have about 85% macroalgal coverage and a dominance of opportunistic species in orange. The main difference is here at the intermediate impact station where we've got Padina pavonica, which is three and a half times more abundant than at the most impact station. The least impact station is different to the previous ones. We've got a better balance between the two types of species. And if we're looking at Jania rubens in this shade of blue, we can see that it's four and eight times more abundant than at the other stations. It's also, um, if we're looking at Cistozera in this color, it's present at this station, but less than 1% present at the other stations. So we can see a general dominance of late successional species or a proliferation, let's say, of late successional species. Coming back to the hypothesis, this one can actually be accepted. Um, and we've shown a negative relationship between EEIC and Malusi, the two indices, um, which has also been supported by the literature that find this negative relationship, but on an even larger scale. The decrease in overall macroalgal coverage could be perhaps explained by turbidity and sedimentation um, from the rivers, which may be limiting growth by burying the macroalgae with sediments. So there's further evidence for this actually in the fact that we see sediments at these two stations, the more impacted one closer to the rivers, we see dead algae covered in sediments in the quadrats. So, so far we've shown that carbon content coverage and the ecological status are negatively correlated with increasing human impact. But are these variables correlated to each other? Well, let's find out. We've actually shown that only organic carbon content and coverage are correlated at a significant level. Um, it's a positive and moderately strong correlation we see here. Um, 
So we've got to update this hypothesis because we've got to remove composition from it. What's interesting is that the two variables that are correlated are how we defined blue carbon potential for this study. So this blue carbon potential and its components increase or decrease synergistically. A fundamental limitation to this study is that we're left wondering how much of the carbon that's in macroalgae biomass here on this rock eventually gets exported and stored at other sink habitats. This is missing in general in the literature, this link. Although studies show that this export factor, as we may call it, is subject to vary per species. So late successional and calcifying species have generally been shown to export more of their carbon than opportunistic species. What does this mean for this study? Well, it seems as if the blue carbon potential may be further reduced with increasing human impact. And this is because we had more late successional and calcifying species at, um, we had less of these species at more impacted sites. So this brings me now to my conclusion, which is that we've shown that the blue carbon potential is reduced with increasing human impact. We've shown this not only for the two aspects of blue carbon potential that we initially defined, but actually for three aspects of blue carbon potential. We've seen with increasing human impact, a reduction in organic carbon content, also a reduction in overall macroalgal coverage. And finally, we've shown that there's less late successional species at more impacted sites. So that's less species that contribute more to exporting and storing carbon. Now, what does this mean for the inclusion of macroalgae in blue carbon strategies? Well, first of all, we need to make sure that human impacts are mitigated if we're going to properly manage, going to properly manage and conserve these habitats. For macroalgae to be included in blue carbon strategies, we also need further research, specifically for the missing link I showed. Research that shows that management actions at macroalgal habitats lead to increased carbon storage at sink habitats. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank, take a moment to thank everyone at Mayor Lab, without whom this internship would not have been possible. Uh, special thanks to my supervisors and those who helped me in the field, as well as to um, Mara's for all their support. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you for us. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for staying on time. Um, I have for questions. Who would like to start? Century? Okay, start with Elena. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, really good. I have a question about what is missing, actually. So, as you said, the, the export factor. Uh, so, is there a way to, to calculate some models that uh, can be applied to? see how much of these algae actually sink and can represent. Is it okay? Yes, are you referring? Oh, sorry. No, no, tell me. Yeah, so uh, just to clarify, you're referring to the ex how much is exported. Yeah. Right, okay. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, the What's challenging with doing studies on the export factor is that most of the uh, export happens to the deep sea where it's challenging to study because you can imagine it's more expensive. Going deeper is not always easy. Um, so maybe we need submarines. I don't know. Well, it, there's technology is hopefully catching up to allow more deep sea research on macroalgae. Um, but in general, ways to measure the, not necessarily the export, but let's say the amount stored um, are a common method is to take um, sediment cores. So we could, if we were able to reach the sediments where it's mostly in sediments that this um, export eventually gets stored, 
And um, if we were able to take sediment cores in the deep sea, which I know is possible, um, despite being expensive, um, if that's possible, then we can take them back to the lab and do organic carbon content analyses, also inorganic carbon content. The way I did it with the living macroalgae we could do in the deep sea. Um, yeah. yeah, but the export is a bit trickier to measure, like the export itself, because we've got um, so one of the reasons why the export factor decreases is because we've got herbivory and all that, and then tracking it in the different organisms that eat the macroalgae can be a bit challenging. Um, yeah, so I think the sediment cores would be the best way to do this. Okay, thank you. And uh, do you know if there are already studies uh, existing about uh, sediments? Um, if sediment cores have been on... Yeah, but, uh, if they look for uh, the amount of carbon there coming from... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, they do that a lot for other blue carbon habitats. So for Posidonia oceanica, for example, the sea grasses, it's a common method that's used. Um, but for macroalgae, it's honestly, it's only very recently that people have realized how much they can contribute to blue carbon. Um, and right now, there's not as many studies. So I don't, I, I personally didn't come across any studies that did sediment cores in the deep sea for macroalgae. And I think it's just because the, the, um, we need first the po political support, usually to get the funding for this kind of, um, for this kind of science, we need political support. And right now uh, the policy doesn't include macroalgae and blue carbon. So if, as soon as it can get recognized and part of it getting recognized is having more studies, but yeah, the, as soon as it gets recognized, I think it can, more of these studies can be undertaken. Okay, thank you very much for the for the answer. Thank you. Thanks, Okay, uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I have a question about your first value on the introduction about uh, carbon storage or carbon sequestration. Uh, and uh, I don't know if if we if we can uh, take a look. Yeah, this, I'll just share slide. my I'll share my screen again if that's okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so this was on this slide. Yeah, two uh, point. Uh, yeah, and two point six eight. Okay, and this value it's, is a mean of all macroalgae uh, in the Mediterranean. It's, uh, uh, is this value take into uh, into account the seasonal variability? Uh, this is not very precise. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Obviously, there's an uncertainty range with it as well. Um, but the the way the authors calculated this is actually global. So I'm not I'm not talking about just the Mediterranean, and I'm talking about globally, especially because I was comparing to mangroves and yeah, certain like tidal marshes that aren't as like seagrasses we have in the Mediterranean, but the rest are more global. So it is a global value and they do account for seasonality. They took an average of the four seasons, um, but it's it's not so much, see, yeah, it's seasonality. It's They weren't measuring, they were measuring more in sedimentation and sediments. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess they did a lot of cores as well. Well, that's when they were comparing as well to Posidonia. Sorry, the cores were not for the macroalgae. I'm, also, because this paper compared all the different habitats, um, but the the seasonality was taken into consideration, and they used previous research as well and found kind of a balance between what had been previously studied. So there is, I mean, they're getting closer and closer to finding the more accurate global value, if that makes sense. Mm. Well, for me, this was very strange to have a, a a precise value on all the habitats of macroalgae. Uh, that was very strange for me to have a, a estimation, a good estimation. That was very hard to to do that though. And the other um, question is about if you take, uh, if you doing uh, some visual census to have an idea of fish composition or or invertebrate composition of the field, because it's possible to have an impact on the herbivorous herbivorous uh, impacts on the on the zone, the presence of sea urchin, for example, 
who have um, this presence is linked to the human impact also. So did you take into account this param this ecological parameter? So I didn't I didn't measure fish, but I was like I did a lot of preliminary site observations where I because before I chose my research question, I was also looking at maybe fish are impacted and different things like this. Um, and I did notice a big decrease in the amount of fish as we got along the stations. The least impacted stations had more fish. Um, so I think like the, re the organization I'm doing this internship thesis with, uh, they also have a lot of studies on this. They have a program where they look uh, artificial reef program where they look roughly at the same area that I've been looking at for my thesis and they they've shown that the amount of fish is also decreasing um, with increase that closer to the human impact source that is kind of the yeah the data seems to show that trend let's say yeah and for the case of uh, sea urchin um sea urchins I saw them everywhere um I, I i again i didn't measure so it's not these are just visual observations but i i'm pretty sure i saw sea urchins at all the sites um not i wasn't shocked by seeing sea urchins more at one place than another but um yeah i guess we'd need actual studies to confirm yeah. what i'm saying yeah because in the zone with the big impact uh, anthropo uh anthropic impact uh, there are, uh, in general, a uh, lot of uh, sea urchins, so they can have a very important impact on the microalgae. So maybe it's uh, it's important to to take into account in the interpretation or yeah. maybe uh, doing some visual census to have an estimation of the population. Yeah, and so just to come back to that point about the sea urchins and the macroalgae, um, maybe the reason why I've seen them a lot at all the sites like I didn't see a big difference is because it's also important to consider that with my study the human impact gradient I've looked at is more on the higher end we're still very close even the least impacted station is very close to the city center so we've okay. still got a lot of human impact um, less significantly less like the the index shows a reduction in human impact but we're we're still talking about a city center if that makes sense Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Wants to go next. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, <clears throat> you find a correlation be between organic carbon content and the percentage of coverage. Um, <clears throat> how do you explain this biologically? Because find a correlation is not very complicated. Uh, but if there is no explanation, it's just uh, it's nonsense. Okay. Yeah. I, I wouldn't go, this is where we have to be careful also with correlation and causation. Um, but yeah, the correlation, I wouldn't say it's, I think they're both correlated to increasing. I measured three stations where we had increasing human impact. And with increasing human impact, both these variables decreased. So the data points match up in that where I've got more carbon content and more coverage it's matched up. And then where I've got less of each, they're also matched up. Um, but I also, like, if we're talking about just these two variables and not the human impact, well, I guess if, if in areas where macroalgae are thriving, so you've got a lot of coverage, um, then in general, those habitats have been shown to have more carbon storage because it's a long-term process. So if we've got a lot more healthy communities with more that are more abundant, then they have potentially more potential, yeah, more blue carbon potential. Okay, why not? Okay, Do you, 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 if I understand, uh, if I understood well, you cannot, uh, you cannot evaluate uh, the carbon storage uh, potentiality because you you miss some data but i it, is it possible for you to calculate the carbon productivity on your on your site it means how how many carbon is fixed maybe not stored but at least fixed per uh, per year or per month uh, at each station did you try to make this work or it was not possible because of, of 
Yeah, so that that is possible. Um, and it requires some equipment that I just didn't have access to. So I focused more on the the carbon and the biomass, just of, of the fixed value, like the kind of stock in the biomass. Um, but yeah, there are ways to do it. Uh, there, like for example, with redox, and you've got different probes that can measure also the levels of it going in and out, because it is very important to also consider not just the fixed level in the biomass, but how much is going in and out in the productivity, as you say. So there are ways to do it. I didn't do it for the study. Um, yeah, but that could be great for further research as well to take this into consideration and to do this. Yeah. And a, a last question. You, you find a, a strong correlation between the diversity and the Malusi index. Uh, so you say uh, the, 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 the more there is a human impact, the, the less is the diversity. And uh, the, I, I assume the Malusi index is a quite complicated in the in index uh, involving a lot of different parameters. Is it for you possible to decorrelate or to try to explain if there is some uh, indicator in the Malusi, Malusi index really, that explain this result, the reduce the, the, the link with the diversity or not? And you are and you have to work with a, an overall index. Can you have? Is it possible to have more information or some hypothesis on what type of things in the Malusi index impact the most uh, the, the bi biodiversity? Yeah, that's a that's a good point, and that's also something that's I guess a limitation in using the Malusi index is that it accumulates all these stresses without necessarily being able to split them apart. Um, and that's why I also looked at, in parallel, I looked at some satellite data. I was planning on measuring in situ data, but it didn't end up being very representative. So I looked at satellite data of specific variables. So sedimentation, this turbidity thing from the rivers that I was speaking about. Um, so I was, and the evidence of the sediment as well, that I could see where the, the macroalgae had been buried in sediments was an indicator of these kind of stresses as well. So I have a feeling that these played a larger impact than maybe some of the other stresses. But this could also be the fact that we can't split them apart, um, the different uh, anthropogenic stresses. This could also be why we've seen uh, when I've got the curves for the different uh, organic carbon content, we've got the middle site that looks a bit um, as if it doesn't match the reduction pattern. And this could be because different impacts are maybe having more important role at different sites. And that's a limitation that I think would be good for further research to look into um, isolating these impacts. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I feel, so thanks for this nice presentation. Um, so I would like to come back on this transfer that occur um, at the DC level. So which data so far make you state this comment? I mean, make you say that there is this carbon transfer. So which kind of data in the literature do we have to say that? Sorry, are you referring to the same value as before? No, when you are talking about the transfer from the, 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 the carbon storage, so yes. what makes you say that carbon storage are moving to this deep sea level? Okay, yeah. So there's a lot of studies that have been carried out looking at, for example, um, the I'm not sure if you're familiar of the Tara Oceans um, expedition. Um, uh, they have also measured where they find macroalgae. And they some of these large scale expeditions, the Tara is just one example, have found that they have macroalgae floating far, far from where it grows. So like five kilometers offshore sometimes in the deep sea where you don't necessarily have macroalgae because macroalgae are mostly growing at the coast. Um, okay. They found that this export occurs on really large scales. And that's what's quite unique with macroalgae is they don't store their carbon exactly where they grow. They can really travel far distances. And this has been shown by observations in various studies. 
Um, okay, so and, we have information about also the way they transfer because you, you mentioned that if it's drifting or if it's thinking, I mean, it's direct transfer. It's not because some animals are eating and then uh, the yeah, microalgae okay. and then going uh, in another ecosystem. So then when, when you say that this, this uh, storage can be uh, at an other place, so do you think that the, the majority of storage are where? I mean, where, where is the main storage from this microalgae? Okay, so about 90% of the storage goes to the deep sea and 10% goes to other coastal habitats. So sometimes like in Posidonia meadows, you'll find also macroalgae contributes to the carbon in their sediments. Um, but this value, so yeah, this, this is how much gets eventually stored in long-term storage. But you've also got short-term carbon cycles. So some macroalgae, as you say, gets eaten by some herbivores and it enters these short-term carbon cycles where it doesn't actually get fixed for a long time and contribute to climate change mitigation. That yeah, is how they can survive for so long. So if, if they want to do carbon storage, it's also because they are doing also a lot of photosynthesis and, and the metabolism is really active. So if they are going in a deep sea, so how, so you will, you will, uh, you will have a limit regarding the metabolism compared to the, the species that are more surface. So how you can say that the main carbon storage from microalgae are coming from the deep sea? Well, so I, I have an issue with that. Actually. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure. I want to make sure that I fully understood the question. Is it that to prove that in the deep sea where we get sediments, that it's macroalgae that's contrib... Is that what you're asking for? Yeah. Where is the proof that macroalgae is contributing to these sediments? Ah, okay. How, how, how the microalgae from the deep sea can really contribute to the carbon storage? Because they cannot be as active as the one at more surface where doing photosynthesis and so yeah. well yeah so they've taken a lot of again cores can be taken from the deep sea sediment cores and then there's carbon elemental analyzers these instruments that can also trace the source of macro of okay. the carbon so there's been a lot of source tracing of carbon. And this is how we first found out, because before we had no idea that macroalgae could contribute to this. And it's by doing this source analysis, finding out the source of the carbon in the sediments, both at the deep sea, but also in when they did it, when they started doing it for seagrasses here in the Mediterranean, they found that some of it actually didn't come from seagrasses. It came from macroalgae. And this is, yeah, this tracing source. Okay, tracing. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Um, so I will share with you a few comments that uh, you have on, on, uh, on YouTube at the same time. Uh, you had some good luck from uh, Yanis Sava, but I'm coming uh, to Yanis just after. Uh, also from Ina. Um, and then some uh, congratulations from your lab. Thank you. And uh, from other people, so I share that with you. And uh, Yanis had actually uh, one question that I will share with you. Uh, I'll let you answer. Uh, so, do you think that calcifying algae contributes in blue carbon directly on their substrates before being exported elsewhere? As some of them are known to contribute to also enrich building mechanisms. Yes, so I think what Yanis is uh, referring to is the calcifying process in the calcifying algae. Um, some calcifying algae, not the ones from this study, but it's very important to know that some calcifying algae don't actually contribute to um, carbon storage, net carbon storage, because the calcifying process actually um, emits carbon dioxide in itself. So if we're looking at the net carbon dioxide um, storage or emissions, um, some calcifying algae don't contribute to this, but the calcifying algae I looked at in this study are specifically ones that have been shown, like Jania rupens, one that I focused on, is one of the algae that ex of the Mediterranean habitat I looked at. It's one of the algae that 
um, contributes the most to carbon storage overall. So it's, yeah, it's important to distinguish calcifying species and that's a really good point to bring up. Yeah. Okay, and I will finish with another congratulation here. Uh, so congratulations, uh, Florence, and thank you once again for your presentation. See you, uh, see you soon in one of the other events uh, of the Marx Symposium. I hope uh, tomorrow or the day after. Bye-bye, Flo. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. So we are resuming our live uh, in uh, something like five minutes with uh, Fernando. And we will talk about uh, carbon stores and carbon loss, and this time uh, on uh, Stras. Coming back at the first five. So if all those who are still here waiting for Fernando, Fernando will be part of a private session, so it will not be uh, but live. Sorry, we are back this afternoon at 2. Bye-bye.